The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. The Big Dipper, The Seven Sisters, Saturn and Mars. Wonders in the summer night sky are eternal. All week we'll find out what's out there with astronomer Brian Gainsler, astrophysicist Natalie Wallet, aerospace engineer Walter Stoddard, and physics and astronomy professor Matthew Johnson. Tonight, our solar system. That's next on the agenda in the summer. One thing that I've been thinking about lately is that uh, during the day, you know, you know how you get caught up in all the to-do things, like all the things you need to do, the things you need to do in a day, in a week, uh, in a year. And then there's times, again, maybe it's because I am getting older, I'm like, does this really matter in <laughs> the context of things? <laughs> because when I think about like us on Earth, how small, how not insignificant, but like, I guess, insignificant we are. Um, the question that comes to mind is like, how big is our solar system? Walter? Oh, that's a good question. And yeah. how do we measure it? And where do, where do we stop counting? If you, if you look at the, go all the way to Pluto, but then, then you have the, the Kepler belt that continues after that. So do you, how far do you count? And we're discovering new objects all the time. And then what about the comets that are on the huge loops do we count those too? Because they are orbiting the sun, so technically they're part of our system too, even though we don't see them for a hundred years or so. So we don't really know how big it is. Is that the answer? We we have a ballpark idea, but it is very hard to define. There's no like sign and then cross the sign here. And you're, <laughs> this way you're to no the solar system. That's right. Exactly. Solar space. I, I, I'm sure there's a sign, but it keeps moving. Like the that's right. The, the, the where the solar wind stops. Yeah. It moves in and out. Um, mm -hmm. you know, over that 11 year cycle that the sun goes through. Yeah, so it gets sort of, the solar system sort of breathing yeah. along with the sun. So even that boundary is kind of changing. But we've sent probes, Voyager 1 and 2, and um, for like 10 years, every like week, we'd be like, okay, now it's out of the solar system. Okay, no, no, <laughs> now it's out of the solar system. And they do, they have cross the threshold where their measurements show that it is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. It seems to be a little bit less under the influence of the sun and more in what we call interstellar space. But yeah, it's this is nature, right? It doesn't have defined boundaries or lines or categories, and we're just trying to like put our own definitions on it. Mm -hmm. Brian? Yeah, so I, 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 I when I was uh, early in my career, I, I worked at MIT where they were monitoring the data from Voyager and it was like a, a, a running joke, <laughs> like, oh, have you left the sol solar system again this week? And, you know, they sort of rolled their eyes, but it just sort of illustrated just how complex the solar system is. And so sometimes Voyager would cross the boundary out into space, but then sometimes the, the edge, that boundary would expand and overtake Voyager from behind. Mm -hmm. And they were seeing these data come in like, you know, just a, f a few hours after they were received. And it was pretty exciting to talk to my colleagues and, and then actually talk over lunch saying something's happening. And if we come up, if it keeps, if this signal keeps go go going up or dropping down tomorrow, I think we can say that we've moved into like a new, a new, a new zone. Mm -hmm. So um, it's amazing that these satellites that were launched in the 70s mm -hmm. with really basic technology and less computing power than a phone mm. are still telling us now in 2023 what the what the solar system looks like. That is incredible. Um, but we, we do know that we have uh, eight planets, five dwarf planets. Some people would fight you about that eight planets. <laughs> okay. <but laughs> some okay, go on. warriors would, right, would right, fight right, you. Right, 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 right. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay, maybe. Okay, I'll add that. Um, more than 200 moons and more than a million asteroids within our solar system. How do we know uh, if we have more planets in our solar system? So we actually have a theoretical planet called Planet 9 or Planet X, mm -hmm. which we think might exist beyond even the orbit of Pluto. We haven't observed it, but we've sort of seen uh, all of the orbits of all of these other objects sort of like accumulating into this one spot, like aligning in such a way that leads us to believe that something is there gravitationally tugging on these other bodies. And so we think it might be something that's sort of like the size of 
a mini Neptune, a little bit smaller than Neptune. Um, but we've yet to observe it because it's so far away, it would be very hard. We have to wait for it to get a little bit closer to the sun. Mm -hmm. And you might say, well, that sounds completely ridiculous, but that's actually how Neptune was first discovered. It was theoretically discovered before it was observed because scientists at the time saw weird discrepancies in the orbit of Uranus. Mm -hmm. And so they're like, we think there's something there. And then a few years later, they actually observed it. So there's still a lot of discovering left to do in the solar system. What is your favorite planet in our solar system other than, uh, other than Earth? Mm, Venus. It's so extreme. It's the hottest planet in the solar system. Its atmosphere is like sulfuric acid, corrosive, um, and uh, it's the planet of extremes. That's why you that's like it. That's a cool planet. Yeah. Yeah. What about you, Walter? I was going to say Earth, because that's where I keep all my stuff. But, <laughs> <laughs> but if I need to choose a different one than uh, Mercury. Mer why? It's fast. Yeah. It's, it's the closest to the sun. It's the fastest orbit. Messenger of the gods. No. Always on time. <laughs> and, and I have a problem with being on time. So Mercury would be my favorite. It's aspirational. <laughs> yeah. It's aspirational. aspire to be like Mercury. I, I aspire to be like it. Yeah. yeah. Keep your dreams in front of you. So I'm going to break the rules and say Pluto, even though Pluto got kicked out <gasps> of, the, of the planet. Can you tell us why than... Pluto was kicked out just for... Well, it... <laughs> this, this could get violent and complicated. <laughs> But um, it, it, people were trying to define, in the early 2000s, astronomers wanted to actually write down a definition of what a planet was. Mm -hmm. And they said it needs to be round, it needs to orbit the sun, and it needs to be significant enough that it clears out its, its neighbourhood with its gravity. And it basically, like, you know, it's the only car in its lane. And so Pluto is round and it orbits the sun, but it, it's not big enough to clear out its neighbourhood. And so that meant that Pluto was kicked out. And one of the reasons I did this was sort of a practical one is, is that if Pluto is a planet, there's several other objects that then are as big as Pluto and should also be planets. And people were saying, well, you know, where is it going to be? What are school children going to do when you have to memorise 80 <laughs> planets? So, you know... The, what the about line... the children when someone right. think of the children? <laughs> exactly. Like, the line stops here. Yeah. So I was, I was like, yes, death to Pluto, good riddance, <laughs> you suck. Like, good... I'm so happy you're gone. <laughs> and so I was a Pluto hater until the, the, those images came back a few years ago from mm. the Pluto... Was it called Pluto Express? Was that New it? Horizons? Oh, yeah, New Horizons, New sorry. New Horizons. And they sent back the pictures of Pluto and I went from like a, lo a hater to a lover. Over it's got night. a heart on it. It's got it a little heart. Everything. It's so cute. Yeah. Yeah. And it just made me realise that Pluto is like this... It's just... It's the odd one out. Like, you know, our, our standard textbook cartoon theories of how the solar system formed mm -hmm. don't explain Pluto. Mm -hmm. And... It's just this whole treasure box of things that we smug astronomers had not properly incorporated into our ideas. So I now see Pluto, like others have always seen it, as like, you know, the, the little world that could. Oh. And so I've, I've switched over and I'm sorry, Pluto, for all of that Do you anger. all agree that Pluto should be the ninth? Uh, I mean, is that what you're no, saying? No, no. no you're not. I do not think that it should be a planet, but it is my favorite when, world in the It's your solar favorite, system. okay. Because right. right. we're not exactly the panel to make that decision. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Natalie? Um, since Brian flagrantly broke the rules, I will also break the rules, and I will choose a moon instead mm. of okay. a planet, but not our moon, um, Enceladus. Mm -hmm. One of Saturn's moons. Uh, and uh, if I had to bet on where alien life might exist in the solar system, I would not bet it on Mars. I would bet it on a world like Enceladus. Well, how come? Because it's an ice moon uh, covered in ice, and there is a liquid ocean, we believe, underneath that crust of ice. That's so cool. And one of the reasons why we think there is that liquid ocean is because there are ice volcanoes on the top uh, that is blowing out this water. And we've actually had some probes that have sort of like sniffed that gas and the, the ejection. And so there are these hints that we haven't found, like, life, but we found what could be food for life potentially in there. Uh, and so these water worlds or, or ice worlds, I think, are really interesting candidates in terms of finding alien life. Well, what about Mars? You said uh, not our moon, but um, <laughs> uh, let's talk uh, about Mars. Is there a possibility of, like, life there on Mars? I think there's a possibility. It's a really... I, I mean, I don't think there are, like, walking, talking Martians, but if there are little bacteria or viruses or something very small and simple on Mars, it's really, really hard mm -hmm. to, uh, to tell whether that's true without sort of going there and doing sophisticated experiments. And the probes that we're now sending or paying to send are getting more and more sophisticated and doing more experiments. My own gut feeling, and, you know, I don't work on Mars, is, is that they're 
very possibly used to be life on Mars, mm -hmm. but that we're sort of looking now at, at a dead planet that sort of has lost a lot of its atmosphere and all the conditions for life. Um, but maybe there's still something left behind from sort of a better, a better time on Mars long ago. Uh, and Nally, when you said that uh, there's a possibility of life on the moon of Saturn, I thought that was interesting because I think a lot of us think that life would be on the planets, mm -hmm. but not necessarily mm -hmm. on the moons. Yeah, so moons are actually a, a great option because um, we, we were talking about sort of this Goldilocks zone the last time, um, but you you, there are ways around this a little bit. Like, you don't necessarily need a magnetic field to shield you from radiation because ice can sort of do some of that. And so maybe the ocean world inside is protected a little bit. Or even some of the worlds that are around Jupiter, you'd think they would all be too cold because they're very far from the sun. But because of the gravitational pull of something so big as Jupiter, it's kind of warping the planet. It's causing internal heating in mm -hmm. some of these moons. And so, yeah, some of these moons are actually super interesting candidates, um, more so than the planets, I think, for alien life. Of course, every Star Wars fan knows that it, the Ewoks yeah. lived on the moon. That's right, that's right. right. Andor, great yeah. moon. Yeah. Walter, I saw you nodding. Well, and so Jupiter kind of stirs up a question for me, because you're talking about Pluto not being a planet, right? That it can, because it can't clear its orbit. Now, does clear its orbit I, I thought Jupiter has some hitchhiker asteroids that are following it around, or am I, am I mistaken? No, the, yeah, the Trojans, which are like in fixed places on its orbit. Right, right. It's yeah. sort of oh. like it's shepherding them around, okay. actually, because it's so big. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so that's okay then. Yeah. By, by the arbitrary <laughs> definitions that we decided, it's, it's so yes. Big. Yeah, if you kick Jupiter out, like, <laughs> uh, we, we, no one would take us seriously. Yeah. No, no, of course not. Of course not. Though we could vote, I guess. Yeah. Okay. Well, gas planets like Jupiter and Saturn are quite large. Um, why wouldn't they pull smaller planets into their own orbit? Hmm. Matthew? Okay. Well, they're far enough away, and in a way, they have. I mean, they have many, many, many moons, and so. By the definitions we've been speaking about, we don't call them planets, mm -hmm. but they can be quite big. Like Ganymede is the biggest moon in the solar system. It's probably as big as Mercury, if my memory serves me mm -hmm. correct. Mm -hmm. So it's a bit situational and it's like semantics, right? It's still a big <laughs> chunk of rock. <laughs> It was not a planet. But, yeah. uh, but, but you know, when, when the solar system first formed, mm -hmm. the solar system was like um, a pinball game where you've got like the extra mm -hmm. bonus level with you know, a million balls going. So there were all these planets crashing to other planets. You know, we talked last time about that's where the moon came from. So there's probably a whole heap of planets sitting at the bottom of, of Jupiter and Saturn that just mm -hmm. got sucked in early on. And it took a really long time for that to sort of settle down. Yeah. But the solar system's been relatively stable for a long time. All of the low hanging fruit was, was picked off. Yeah. And it's ruled by the sun. Yeah, yeah, the sun is so much more massive. Than, but maybe you can talk about exoplanets where the star is not as massive yeah. as the planets, right? Sometimes yeah. you'll have uh, planets and stars in exoplanetary systems where the star is a lot smaller than the sun and you'll have these gas giant planets that are 10 times the mass of Jupiter and then they'll be sort of comparable. And then you get into this like really sticky situation where we have brown dwarfs, which are like super big planets who sort of are like stars and have partway nuclear fusion at their very start, but they, they're not massive enough to sort of keep that going for their entire life, so What's yeah. nuclear fusion? Nuclear fusion, so this is what um, the fuel is the heart of our sun. Essentially, mm -hmm. the sun is massive enough that at its very core, its center, it's able to crush down hydrogen atoms mm -hmm. and it pushes them together and that's fusing the atoms together, which creates lots of energy. And we want to actually do that as well. That's a cleaner type of nuclear energy than nuclear fission, which we do. We break apart really heavy elements like uranium or plutonium. Mm -hmm. And so this is how stars stay alive and they create that heat by fusing these atoms together. Well, what keeps all the planets seemingly in orbit? So it's all through the gravitational pull of the sun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you can sort of like imagine the solar system being this big rubber sheet. Mm -hmm. And at the very center, you have like a bowling ball. That's the sun. And so all the planets are close enough to that big divot caused in the rubber sheet by the bowling ball that they're sort of trapped 
you you might have like some demos of this at the Ontario yeah, Science yeah, Centre, right? Yeah, you're describing right? the exact equipment that we would use to describe it. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> so all the planets are these little marbles that are sort of stuck in this funnel shape, mm -hmm. but in space there's no friction, there's no loss of energy, so they don't slowly fall towards the centre into the sun. They just stay on those tracks around the funnel. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, in, two, in 2021, something huge happened, um, and I remember watching the news. It kind of felt like when I was younger where there was like a new Madonna video or, you know, there was a new Back to the Future movie. I'm aging myself. Uh, but when the James Webb Space Telescope uh, was launched, there was so much excitement. And it wasn't just like, uh, I guess, in the science world, but we all seemed kind of glued to the news uh, for something that was actually could benefit mm -hmm. uh, us as uh, on, on the planet. Um, can anyone explain the details of the launch of the James Webb Space Telescope? Sure, I guess I have to. I'm, 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 I'm the average scientist for, for Webb. It's in, hanging around your neck. That's right. I always have the mirror on me. That um, is so cool. Uh, so, yeah, this is a mission that is led by NASA, mm -hmm. but with collaboration from the European Space Agency and very exciting for us, the Canadian Space Agency. It's the largest space astronomy mission that Canada has ever been involved in, and it's been in preparation for over two decades now. Sort of, we call it the successor to Hubble. Um, but a lot of differences. It's a lot bigger. It's the biggest telescope you've ever sent into space. And it looks at a different kind of light. It looks at infrared light, which is invisible to us, but mm -hmm. super useful in astronomy to study all kinds of things from the birth of stars to distant galaxies to exoplanets. And so finally, December 25th, 2021, it launched from Kourou in French Guiana. And uh, lots of us were supposed to be deployed all over the world, the yeah. team. I was supposed to be in Baltimore with the, with the operation center, but we had to shut down because of COVID. So we were all watching home, um, but we had the comms loop on and uh, we were all seven in the morning looking at the television and uh, looking at this big Ariane 5 rocket, launch it into space. And I think we were all crying. And, Why yeah. were you crying? Like, cause I just thought it was, so, I, I, I was a, just like a regular person just watching it. And I was really emotional, but for, you must have felt like, I mean, you're you're tearing up right now. Just about <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just thinking thinking of that moment. Um, I, I can't even imagine what it was like for some people who have spent mm -hmm. their whole career working yeah. on on this telescope. Um, I don't, I don't have children yet, but I can imagine maybe it's like sending your kids off to college for the first <laughs> yeah. time and you're not too sure if they're ready for the experience, if you're, you've equipped them appropriately. Um, but it was just a lot of diff like years of work being poured into this one moment mm -hmm. and you're confident that it'll go well, but there's always that one little mm -hmm. worry that like, you know, this is a giant rocket engine that could blow up and destroy mm -hmm. all this work. Mm -hmm. But luckily, it didn't happen. Uh, the launch went wonderfully, and the mission is still going wonderfully now. I want to get everyone's uh, uh, input on this. What was it like for you to watch that? Mm. Uh, much the same as, as Natalie, just mm -hmm. terrified. Uh, I think, how many different points of failure were there? Like three, 300, over yeah. 300. There were 300 different points of wow. failure, and some of them were super finicky, like this, this uh, you know, mirror had to sort of unfurl robotically in this incredibly complicated way. So I just tried to distract myself because I, if I thought about it, I would just convince myself there's no way that this is gonna work. Mm. And so I sort of stopped, turned off the media and TV and just sort of waited for, for the whole unraveling process to, to complete. And I'm still sort of astonished that it worked. I mean, so many satellites do blow up on the launch pad and you see mm -hmm. some colleague who spent like 20 years on this mm -hmm. and for some reason it has nothing to do with them like their whole their whole career is is now just you know a fireball mm -hmm. so um i was just terrified and when, just when, basically wake me up wake me up when it was when over. it's done yeah. <laughs> when you say 300 points of failure like 300 ways that it could go wrong right there, there was this whole complicated stage where this thing that was sort of wrapped up and compressed and and packed into this sort of way in which it would fit into the rocket had to sort of unfurl like one of those pop-up books um, into into a telescope mm -hmm. and it was this incredibly complicated process and if any one of those steps failed then the next steps could not proceed and it would just be a worthless mm -hmm. piece of junk. Wow, yeah. Matthew? Well I mean you strapped a thousand dreams to a high explosive <laughs> and crossed your fingers. I mean I think they've nicely described um, you know just the the human effort that went into making this happen. But it's incredible what that human effort can do. I mean, this is one of the most amazing technological achievements in humanity's history. And I don't think that's an understatement. Mm -hmm. 
Um, if you've you know, had a chance, like watch the video of all the steps that are supposed to happen to go from being inside the rocket to being you know, past the orbit of the moon looking out into space. Um, it's just phenomenal and, uh, you know, beautiful images mm -hmm. and beautiful science and already there are controversies and yes. it's a really exciting endeavor. I mean, it's just incredible what people can do, what humanity can do. You mentioned the images. When those first images uh, came out, you thought what? Beautiful. Beautiful. Yeah, it's yeah. just beautiful. It's like art, right? Yeah. And what about you, Walter? Yeah. So. Of course, at the Science Center, we all scrambled around. It's like, oh, it's launching, it's launching, right? And everyone's talking, getting in touch with everybody else, saying, let's watch, right? Mm -hmm. Because it is exciting, it's amazing. And it's it's going through all of Hubble's greatest hits, right? It's been, been looking even deeper into what we thought we knew, and now, oh, we know a little better now, we know a little more. So mm -hmm. it's it's an exciting unraveling of, of some of the mysteries that we, we still don't have answers yet. Um, I, want, what, I want to talk more about Uranus. Um, I'm mm -hmm. going to sh show you an image right now. Uh, this is an image of Uranus taken by Webb's near infrared camera. Uh, here we can see the solid rings around an aquamarine blue planet. Uranus is an ice giant, the third largest in diameter, 27 known moons, 13 known rings rotates on its side. Theoretically, it could rain diamonds? Say what now, Natalie? <laughs> yeah, the atmospheres of the gas and ice giants are, are really weird because they're, they're ice. And, and when we say ice, we don't mean like water ice. It's mm. a, an, another kind of weird ice um, and gas. But because they're so massive, layers of them are compressed to like hypercritical stages where they're kind of this in-between phase where they're not quite fluid, they're not really solid, and it's not something, that a kind of material that you have sort of all around you, and you end up having really weird things like diamond rings. Uh, going back to that image, um, what makes this image of Uranus so unique? So what I really love about um, this picture of Uranus, and also there was a picture of Neptune um, that was released a little bit beforehand, I often like to think of these two planets as the, the forgotten siblings of the solar system because they've never gotten their dedicated mission or probe. Even Pluto, who is not a planet as we know, um, had new horizons, but all Uranus and Neptune have had are flybys by the Voyager probes. And that happened in the 80s. So since then, we've had not that much information and not that many images mm -hmm. of these planets. And now with Webb, we have this new tool that allows us to see a lot of changes have occurred since those flybys that we don't necessarily understand. Um, I don't know if you want me to bring back that image, but I wanted to get everybody else's reaction on that image of Uranus. Uh, Matthew, looking at that, you think what? Those books that my son was really into that he first saw in the library and got into planets that were images taken in the 80s <laughs> are so much <laughs> worse than this. <laughs> it's just so beautiful. It's incredible yeah. how detailed and you know wonderful i mean you can see all the detail of the rings and um yeah, it doesn't look real like when i look yeah, at it right totally right yeah, yeah it looks yeah. like it looks like a painting yeah it looks like a painting yeah, it looks like yeah. Art. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh brian what do you think so i feel cheated that we don't have rings <laughs> i mean there are, there are four planets that we know of that have rings and each of them are different and they're all quite spectacular and beautiful and, um, and we don't have them. And, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've seen space art and science fiction where, you know, what it looks like to be on the surface of a planet when there's, like, rings arcing over the sky. And I'm thinking, mm -hmm. like, none of us could do anything but look up all the time if there were, like, rings arching mm -hmm. over the whole, yeah. the whole expanse. So uh, I, I, one day I want to be on a planet with rings around it. I wonder if there's someone we can talk to about that. <laughs> Make it right. <laughs> you, you could blow up the moon, but... <laughs> That would no, make no friends, but that would create other problems. Wasn't that one of the Goldilocks conditions? <laughs> <laughs> Remember where I keep my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so true. What do you think, Walter, when you look at that image? So it's gorgeous. It's absolutely beautiful. And, and there was something that you said that, that kind of triggered my imagination. So that what's the, the temperature on the surface? Like, we're calling it an ice giant, right? But isn't it a few thousand degrees Celsius? Right, because it's 
If you go deep, deep enough inside, inside okay, okay. yeah, that's right, yeah. But um, no, on, on the surface, it's, it's, I believe, the coldest of the planets. Uh -huh. Very windy. Uh, you wouldn't want to live there. You, wanna, you wouldn't no, want to no, have your it, stuff there. It. Never mind. Certainly, that. no. <laughs> no. Just extraordinary. Yeah. Well, on tomorrow's show, we're going to be talking about the galaxy. Uh, so I wanted to kind of uh, bridge these, uh, our discussion with our discussion for tomorrow. How does our solar system move through the galaxy? Natalie? Yeah, so a lot of people think that we are around, like, they're comfortable with the idea that these planets are going around the sun, but they imagine the sun being still. But no, it's careening 225 kilometers per second around the center of our Milky Way. And uh, it takes a very long time, about 250 million years, to go all the way around. And at the heart of the galaxy, we have this supermassive black hole, this monster that's not any danger to us, yeah. luckily. But um, I mean, you say black hole, I'm like, <laughs> I know, ah! <laughs> I know. But so um, you have the sun and you have the planets moving around it, but really they're all moving around the center of this galaxy. And I always like to tell kids the last time we were exactly in this spot in the Milky Way, there were dinosaurs on the Earth and not the recent dinosaurs, like some of the first dinosaurs. When you say that, they say what? Like, they, they can't, it blows their minds, I think. Yeah, yeah. If you combine dinosaurs and astronomy, forget it. The kids are really enthralled. <laughs> right. well, the other thing I, I love is that not only is the sun and the solar system going around the galaxy in a circle, but it's also, as it does so, it's bobbing up and down like a cork on the water, so it has this sort of oscillating pattern as it goes through. And so some of the things that we don't understand about the history of the Earth, uh, things like ice ages and extinctions, could actually be related to sort of the different conditions and gravitational interactions that we experience as the, uh, as the whole, th our whole solar system very slowly bobs up and down. So the orbit is actually very complex. And every other star in the galaxy is doing its own thing, its own circle and its own bobbing as well. It's so it's this incredible complicated ballet. Yeah. It makes up the fact that we don't have rings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I love our galaxy. It's, it's just such a, a beautiful, amazing place. Well, we're going to talk more about the galaxy on tomorrow's show, but thank you so much for this. It's been really illuminating. I wish I was in, I don't know if you teach classes, <laughs> you want to write books. I want to read all the things and listen to all the lectures. Thank you so much for helping us understand this. Appreciate thank your you. time. Thank you. Thank you. Our guests all this week are Brian Gainsler, director of the Dunlap Institute for Astronomy and Astrophysics and Canada Research Chair and Professor at the University of Toronto. Astrophysicist Natalie Wallet, who is Deputy Director of the University of Montreal's Trottier Institute for Research on Exoplanets and Outreach Scientist for the James Webb Space Telescope in Canada. Walter Stoddard, researcher, programmer, and longtime science communicator at the Ontario Science Centre. And Matthew Johnson, associate professor of physics and astronomy at York University and research associate faculty at the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.